doing? I'm not used to wearing one of these. Peter, are you up there? All right, can you guys hear me okay? Hope so. Here we go. All right, let's open with a word of prayer because I need it. Here we go. Lord, thank you for this morning, for this time. And Lord, more than anything, I just ask that you help me. I know what you've given me. Help me to deliver it. Lord, help these folks quiet their heart for the next little bit and just put the day aside, put whatever thoughts they had before church aside, and just simply look at your word, take it in, and be refreshed. In Jesus' name, amen. Judges chapter 7 this morning. If you have a Bible with you, Judges chapter 7. <clears throat> Judges chapter 7. If you don't have a Bible with you and you'd like to follow, there's one in front of you in the pew. Always remember to pray for Miss Naomi, a little sweet angel in heaven, but don't ever forget. Judges chapter 7. We're going to verse, do verses 1 through 8 to start with. Judges chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. Here we go. Then Jerubbabel, who, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath uh, saved me. Now therefore go, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the of the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And whomsoever I say unto thee, This shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people under the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Every one that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as the dog lappeth, him shall thou set by himself. Likewise, every one that boweth down upon his knee to drink, and the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred men that have lapped, I will save you, and deliver the Midianites into thine hand. And let all the other people go every man unto his place. So the people took victuals into their hand and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man, unto his tent, and retained those three hundred men, and the host of Midian that was beneath him in the valley. Now slide down to verses 15 through 21. <clears throat> verses 15 through 21. And it was so, when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof, that he worshipped and, in, uh, and returned into the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. And he divided the three hundred men into three companies, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand and with an empty pitcher and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look on me, and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that, as I do, so shall ye do. When I blow the trumpet, I sh and I sh and, oh, I'm sorry, verse 18, and I shall blow with a trumpet, and I and all that are with me. Then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp, 
and say, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the, the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. And they had put, but newly set the watch, and they blew the trumpets and brake their pitchers that were in their hands. And the, the three companies blew their trumpets and brake their pitchers and held their lamps in their left hands and trumpets in their right hands to blow withal. And they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp, and all the host ran and cried and fled. This morning what I want to take a look at is Gideon's 300 men. And uh, just to kind of give you a head start, because I've been looking at this for days, but what I want you to, what I want us to look at this morning is what was different about Gideon's 300 men and how does that apply to us today? So the first thing I just want you to know out of uh, verses 1 through 8, when we, the first part we read, Gideon was instructed uh, how to choose the men that the Lord was going to use. Gideon was instructed by the Lord how to choose the, the men uh, that the Lord was going to use. And so from the very get-go, I want you to see God had a plan. And just like God had a plan then, he has a plan now. We just need to pursue it. I found it interesting if you look in verse 2 at the last half. The last half of verse 2. Look at what it says. Uh, the, the people are too many for me to give, in to, uh, to give the Midianites into their hands. And there's a reason why. Lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, My own hand hath saved me. God did not want Gideon and the rest of the Israelites to get puffed up about a win, about the good things that were happening in their life. It's no different for us. I just want you to see it's right there in Scripture. As you build your life, as you go on with your life, good things are going to come your way. Do you work hard? Yes. Do you try to choose right? Yes. But always remember, it's not by your hand that your life amounts to anything. And for guys, I think we struggle with that a lot. At least I know, for me, in my whole life, I've been trying to build something. That's just how us men are wired. Trying to build something. And I've struggled against that for years. The reality of it is, guys... We just need to humble ourselves and realize from the very get-go that if you don't just understand that without God your life is nothing, we're wrong from the beginning. So I just encourage you to embrace the fact that God had a plan and that God wants us to be humble all the way through and just keep looking for what it is that he's trying to do and that really when the good stuff comes, it's not because I was smart. It's not because you were smart. God opened a door. And we need to continually be a thankful people and not start building up some kind of pride that, you know what, I know something. Now let me teach you. Because that's not true. All right, as we keep on moving. So what I want you to see in verses 1 through 8 is that God instructed Gideon, this is how I want you to proceed. God had a plan, and uh, Gideon followed it. Now, when we read verses 15 through 28, or 21, we saw that the men were all supposed to take their pitcher and their trumpet and their lamp. Now, does that, and they all know that they're going against the Midianites. Does that sound like a good battle plan to you. When I read it, I thought to myself, if somebody said, grab your trumpet, grab your lamp, and grab your pitcher, we're going to battle, I'd go, what are you talking about? We'll never win with this. But the fact of the matter is, that's what they were instructed to do. 
So as you go on in your life and the Lord directs you to do something, maybe it doesn't make any sense to you. Maybe right now it isn't a good time in your mind to be doing that. But the bottom line of it is, God lays out, here's what I want you to do. Do this. But it doesn't make any sense. No, here's what I want you to do. Do this. And if you'll follow, good things will happen. And so I just wanted you to see. The Lord showed him the plan, and then the Lord says, here's what you're going to use. From a human standpoint, looking at it, it looks ridiculous. It'll never work. But anytime God's in it, you can't lose. Don't forget that. Don't forget that because Satan would like us to be discouraged. But God's got the pieces. And he doesn't want us to get puffed up with pride because of a win. He wants us to rejoice in God took something small and made it big. So, uh, that was the battle of Gideon. And just to make a long story short there, Gideon went on to win. Win big. I don't want to go over all those details this morning. What I want to do this morning is talk about today. Because you can go home and read your Bible and finish the details of Gideon all on your own. This morning I'd like to talk about us. About today. And so my first question for you this morning would be, just as Gideon had a battle, answer for yourself. Do we have battles? I would say yes. We have battles, personal battles. And we also have an overall battle. I can't fill in the blanks on your personal battles for you. You know what they are. You don't need me to tell you. But the overall battle is for the hearts and the souls of every living person person that there is because someday just as TJ talked about in Sunday school this will all be over and the only thing that will matter is whether or not you had Christ as your Lord and Savior and so there is a battle this morning it is a spiritual battle maybe it's even a harder battle to fight than a physical battle because a physical battle you can see your enemy there he is right there Keep an eye on them. Don't let that one get behind you. But in a spiritual battle, you can't always see it. You might not even hear it. You got to be on your feet. So this battle is even tougher than Gideon's battle. And so this morning, what I want you to consider is this. Is there a battle? Yes. When Gideon was told who to choose, it was Gideon. It's the guys that go like this. To drink. Not those that got down on their hands and knees. and The ones that were always looking. God wanted to use the ones that were always looking. And so this morning I want to ask you, do you think you'd fit in with Gideon's 300 men? The fact of the matter is, only you can answer it. Are you always looking for what God's going to do next? Are you expectant? We need to be an expectant people. God, would you agree with me? God wants to do something. And he doesn't want to do it by accident. He's looking for people that are watching. Watching for those that hurt. Looking for those that are looking for answers to life's problems. Looking for somebody that really wants to know God. Because you can find all kinds of things out there to listen to. And they're not always true. You need to back up what you believe with God's word. 
Because otherwise, it's nothing more than an opinion. And so this morning, I want you to realize that God's telling Gideon, hey, the ones that are looking, the ones that always got an eye out, the ones that are expectant, they're looking for something to happen, those are the ones you want. It's no different here today. I'm going to go again, so forgive me right along, okay? I want to tell you about the first day I came through the door here. I don't know where all you're from. I remember the first day my wife and I and our kids came to church here. Coming When we moved from Sioux Falls to here, we wanted small town. But can I just be honest with you, Elkton? When we came to town, it wasn't, oh, hello, good, hi, how are you? Where are you from? What's your name? It was a lot of looks. They knew you. They knew you were there. But it wasn't what you'd call warm. And so the first day I walked through the doors here, my wife and I still joke about it to this day. The joke is, I'll take the baby, you go first. Because we weren't, based on what we had already experienced in the town, and we were glad to be here, the town just wasn't so embracing. They knew you were there, but my experience has been in this town, you make the first move. It's, hi, how are you? In other words, what I'm saying is, the new guy has to make the first move. That's my experience here. And so I come in the door here at church. We make it through the door, and there's some people standing out in the foyer. Not a lot, but a few. And those doors were closed just like they are right now. And I stood down there at the, at the bottom, and I remember one, there was a number of people, but I remember one gentleman in particular that was there. And when I walked in the door, he had his hands in his pockets like this, talking to someone else. And when I walked in the door, they went and back to their business. It wasn't hello. It wasn't nothing. Did that feel warm? No. Was I offended? No. It was Elkton. But all that to say, I came through the door, and in that foyer, I never got a greeting when I came in the door. We stood there because I'm not one to be late. I wasn't here for Sunday school, but I was here for the AM service. And where I grew up, you're not late. You're not late. I want you to think about this, folks. I hope I don't offend anybody, but I'm just going to shoot it straight. I, I love you. I hope you know that. And if you don't love me, that's okay. Being late is a character issue. You know where you're supposed to be. And yes, I know there's children. I've had them too. And I'm not, I'm not asking you to be perfect. What I am saying is, you're, you're to work on time, right? You are. Otherwise, you wouldn't work there anymore. When your other appointments show up, you're there on time for the most part, aren't you? Hey, guys, this is the most important hour of the week. Well, I'm not preaching and I'm not teaching, so it's okay if I don't show up till after songs. No, listen, you need to come in and get your heart ready. Shut the noise out. You need to come in, and maybe it's not about you. Maybe it's about greeting somebody else. Can you be here on time for somebody else? All the, I just all that to say, guys, I love you dearly, but we got to step up our game even more because there's work to be done. There really is a battle going on for the hearts and souls of men and women and children. And so to finish my story, I come through the door, and there was no handshake. There wasn't even a hello, how are you this morning? Or, hi, what's your name? Nothing. Sunday school came to an end. And, praise the Lord, 
Rick was standing up here teaching. Doing his, doing his job, being faithful. I saw it. He was standing right, right here. All those people, not all of them, some of those people, when Sunday school was over, they got up and, oh, I don't know, maybe they had bathroom, maybe they need to check kids, whatever. Or maybe they just wanted to stand up for a little bit. They all walked right on past me. I was right down there at the bottom of the steps. Like, remember, Sunday school, those are, those are your people that are usually, they're not visitors. When you're here for adult Sunday school, you're, what you're saying is you want to learn. They all walked right past me. Never said a word. And the guy that had just got done serving right here walked through those steps, down, through those doors, down the steps, didn't go past me, was the first man to shake my hand in this church and say, well, hello, what's your name? I'm glad you're here. Now, if Rick would have left me hanging, I probably wouldn't, you know, I, we would have came in and sat and, you know, nobody even talks to you here. People need to be loved. People need to be acknowledged. And every person, I don't care who they are, has value in God's eyes. I don't care if they smell like cigarette smoke when they walk in. I don't care if they're tattoos from the top of their hairline to the bottom of their feet. God loves them. We have no other option but to reach every living soul that comes through that door and love them where they're at. And so what I'm, what I'm saying this morning is Gideon was told, hey, it's the, it's the guys that they're looking. They're, they're getting their water, but they're looking. We need to be like that. When you come here in the morning, and it's not just here, it's everywhere in life. Are you looking for where God wants to use you that day? Because if you're not looking, you'll probably walk right on by. Who did Rick, who used, who did God use that morning in my life? Rick even. Because he was looking. Everybody else, right on by. And so this morning, as we consider Gideon's 300 men in our own lives, the first thing I want to challenge you with is, Are you looking? Not just looking where you want, but are you looking anywhere? Because sometimes you're going to be asked to do things that you might not be comfortable with. And the other thing of it is, is your heart expectant? Do you expect God to work in your life? Or is it, you wouldn't believe what God did today. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I wasn't even thinking about it. And Well, this is what happened. God saved me from. Are you expectant? God uses people. Read it throughout Scripture. God uses people. You get to choose whether you want to be used or not. Because if you say no, no, God will not override that. He will not override that. The most powerful thing on the face of the earth is you saying no because it shuts God off right there. And until you say yes, game over. You cannot be used. So you answer for yourself this morning. Are you willing? Are you expectant? Are you looking? Because if you're not, you're not being all that you could. Just listen to the people that God does things in their life. They have joy. They have purpose. Their, their prayers mean more to them because it's real. It's active. That's where we need to be this morning. 
And so this morning, you need to choose. Do you want to be like Gideon's men? Are you looking? Are you expecting? And do you want to be used? The second thing, that's looking outward. Now let's talk about looking inward. Because there's two different ways we get to go. Out and in. This morning, let's look at inward. I want to tell you about deciding to join this church. So, I finally was greeted at the front door. We came regularly. We liked the preaching. Good pastor. Loved the people of these pews. Loved the people of these pews. We want to join. Well, there was a problem. I grew up Catholic. Thankful for it. Not bashing anybody this morning. I grew up Catholic. When I was a baby, I was baptized Catholic. Because that's what they do. And at my house where I grew up, my dad was Catholic and my mom was Lutheran. It's just something that they never agreed on. They loved one another enough to get past it. But it was never something they agreed on. And so when I was just a little fella, I got baptized Catholic. And I got baptized Lutheran. Man, I was wet. But I come here and I walk in the door. These people, they've always got a Bible in their hand. Good people. I love them to death. But they're always going, look what the Bible says. Look what the Bible says. And it's a good thing. It came time to join. Yeah, interested in joining. Well, what about getting baptized? Well, I've been baptized twice already. What are you talking about? And they said, well, but you haven't been baptized by immersion, have you? Well, no, but I've been baptized twice. There was a little bit of me, I'll be honest with you, when that came about, there was a little bit of me that wanted inside to say, I've been baptized twice as many times as you have. Now you're going to tell me I need it again? What's up with you? Just loosen up a little bit. Jeez. That's, I'm telling you that that's how I felt. But here's the deal. I did want to belong to this church. And for the record, I will say this. It is the best church I've ever belonged to. And I believe that for two reasons. It follows the Bible. And the people here really do love one another. I encourage you to get in. But back to my story. So, well, you, you know, you've been baptized Catholic and you've baptized Lutheran, but we need you to really get baptized. And that, that little bit of pride in me, you guys, I've, I've been wet twice as much as you. Just chill. But no, the... You need to get baptized. And we didn't argue about it, but you know what I did? I sat down with my Bible. I would encourage you, if you got issues, if you got questions, always do things God's way. Always do things God's way. Oh, I don't like it. Well, guess who's wrong? And so I sat down with my Bible... And I started looking. And if you want to see it for yourself, I mean, there's different spots. But if you want to condense it down into a nutshell, and maybe this morning you're sitting here and you're in the same spot I was. Mark chapter 1. And you look at Jesus getting baptized. Because always remember, Jesus is our example. I don't care what the Catholics say. I don't care what the Lutherans say. I've been Presbyterian. I don't care what the, uh, the Presbyterians say. I've been Evangelical Covenant. I don't care what they say. And you know what? I'm Baptist now. And I don't care what the Baptist says. Show me what the Bible says. So I sat down with my Bible. And if you want to just do a mini, mini study, because there's spots everywhere, mini, mini study, Mark chapter 1. 
your, if your preacher was here this morning, in fact, you just go there. Mark chapter 1. Keep your finger in, in Judges, but just for fun. The pastor maybe would be proud of me for this one. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Let me find it because I wasn't even planning on going here. And it is verse... Okay, let's start with verse 9. Verse 9. Here we go. Mark chapter 1, verse 9. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth to Galilee and was baptized of John. Look at what it says next. Now your pastor, if he was here, he'd say, The King James Bible is perfect. There are no mistakes. And I believe it. Look at the word that is used. Baptized of John in Jordan. What is Jordan? The river. The Jordan River. He was in the Jordan River. Okay, not, not grab a handful and go. Now, okay, it gets better. Let's go a little more. Look at verse 10. And straightway... Coming up out of the water. When you get sprinkled, you don't come up out of the water. He saw the heavens open and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. The only baptism that pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that's all it is, is an outward profession saying, this is what I believe. The only baptism that does that is baptizing by immersion. And when I looked at that in my Bible, and I didn't have the pastors holding my hand doing it, I sat down by myself. Then it was just a matter of, okay, I know the truth. I know what the Bible says. Now it's just a matter of, okay, Mark, you going to buck it? Just because you had your sprinkling as a Catholic and sprinkling as a Lutheran. and Are you going to buck it or are you going to do what the Bible says? See, that's where you got to make a choice. Every one of us. You're going to choose to believe and act on what the Bible says, or you're going to say, well, like my mother, my mother, I love my mother. I'm not saying, when I say this, I'm not saying anything bad about my mother. I'm being honest. My mother lost her dad when she was 18 years old. It was, she's never, my mom is 80 some years old now, 82 I think. And she has, even with my mom having dementia, she has not stopped talking about the day, how, all the good times, but also the day her dad died. Never got over it. Ever, ever, ever. Her and her family used to go to Emmanuel Lutheran Church, Ward, South Dakota. To this day, she talks fondly of it. I think for my mom to hold on to being Lutheran was the equivalent of, because my grandma wasn't a church-going lady, that was where my dad was. That is what, my dad and I were there. I was baptized there. And so I think it holds extra special for her. And so she was never willing to let go of that. And so to this day, if you went down to Flandreau and seen my mom, well, ma'am, did you ever go to church? Yes, yes. Emmanuel Lutheran, Ward, South Dakota, proud Lutheran. And that's okay. But I had to come to the point where when I looked at what the Bible said, you have to choose between what you know is right and other people can give you reasons. This family has always been Catholic. I've heard that one. If you're not Catholic, you won't go to heaven. I've heard that one. But you know what? I couldn't find it in God's word. And as a man, as an adult, whether you're a man or a woman, we all have to choose what we believe. What we believe. What you believe. 
Because someday, only you will answer for what you have done with your life. You're not going to be able to say, well, my dad said, won't count. And so as I looked in Scripture for myself as an adult man, it became obvious to me that Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River by immersion, and it is the only baptism that pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that is its purpose. So I needed to get over my little pride thing. I've already been baptized twice. I don't need a third time. I know I'm saved, and I was. But I hadn't been baptized right. You go, geez, you're talking about baptism on and on and on. It's just a little bit more water. No, it's more than that. Because if you will not obey God in the small things, you will never obey him in the big things. And you know what else on top of that? Here's a little whipped cream and cherry for your Sunday. God always blesses obedience. When Gideon was going, oh, Gideon, this is what I want you to do. Does taking less people seem like it makes sense? And then, okay, you got your 300. Now, grab a trumpet, grab a pitcher, and grab a lantern because we're going to wipe out the Midianites. Does that sound like it makes sense? But it took obedience for the victory to come. In our lives, that is how we need to do it. We need to look in God's word, and where you differ in your opinion or in your actions from God's word, just humble yourself. I had to. And I climbed in the water, and I got baptized Jesus' way. Did it change me? I'll say yes, in the sense that not that more water helps, but when you start exercising your obedience muscles, what happens to a muscle when you exercise it? It gets stronger. It gets stronger. Yeah. Obey, and you'll be stronger. Obey, and the blessings will come. Obey, and God will be more real in your life than he's ever been before. But if you're going to go, oh, <laughs> I've already covered that. I've been there. I've done that. You're going to struggle. So this morning, considering uh, Gideon's 300 men, are you looking outward? Are you expectant? And looking inward. Are you willing to do what you know is right? You don't have to know the whole Bible today. But of the Bible that you do know, are you obeying it to the best of your ability? And that is between you and God. That is not between you, me, and God. Okay? So just clear the slate. Look hard at what you've got and where you're at. The bottom line of it is willingness. Willingness. Where are you going to tell God no? That is a dangerous, dangerous place to be. Gideon didn't go, God, you want me to go against all those Midianites with 300 guys and we don't even have a sword? No, I, you know, I'll come up with a more tactical approach. No. Just get in. Do what you know to do. And if you, if you struggle the first time, it's okay. Just like me, I went, telling me I need to be baptized again? I've already been there twice. Why don't you guys just get over yourself? No. Look at what God's word has to say. And God will bless your life. God will become closer to you, and you will have the joy of knowing you're doing the best you can do. And so this morning as we close, I just want you to consider those things. Life really is good. 
But if you're going to beat your head against the wall, it gets tough. Are you doing what you know to do? Be to church on time. Can I just challenge you just a little more? You do love me, right? You're not going to, like, kick me out of church after this, are you? Listen. When, if, you're, if your child went to school and never opened a school book, what would you tell them? Well, I don't get it. They were talking about some stuff, and, well, they did some stuff on the chalkboard, but I just don't get it. You know, the teacher's not a very good teacher. What would you say to your child? And yet, on Sunday morning, when you come in, are you ready to crack the book? See it for yourself. I'll never forget the day I got saved. John chapter 3. I remember it. Why? Because I was looking at it. The Bible says you must be born again. Not, you might, you could, if it's convenient for you. You must be born again. And it was right there in front of me. I could see it. I had to choose. I knew I wasn't born again. But if you're going to go, <laughs> hey, Pastor, you need to straighten your tie out. Are you looking expectantly? Dig. Take it in. Let it roll around in there. Even if it doesn't make sense right away, let it roll around in there. And you got a pastor, I'll tell you what, and I know you know this, and I'll shut up in a minute, I promise. The pastor you got right now, I've known him since he's been a boy. You know what makes him different from a lot of others? He has always loved people. If somebody's going to take a hit, he'll take the hit before you do. The guy loves people. And he loves God. And so as he's up there preaching his heart out on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights, and he, someday he's going to bring you a new thought you never thought of before. And instead of going, oh, well, just because it's in the Bible 75 times, what does that mean? He is standing between God and people that he loves. And he's trying to bring the two together. Because that's when things happen. Good things happen. So someday, when he says something that makes you go, slow down. Slow down. Because the guy that's telling you is the guy that he loves you and he loves God and he's just trying to go like this. Come on, guys, you can do it. Just come together, you'll see. Oh. Love your pastor. I've sat under pastors that don't love people. It's not pretty. If you get in their way, they squash you. If you don't agree with them, you're not their friend anymore. You don't support them. Hey, love your pastor. Look expectantly. And then, are you willing to take it in? When your life doesn't match what Scripture says, don't fight it. Yeah, I'll get baptized, you bet. And you move forward to the next thing. And you just keep growing. And God keeps using you more. I'm thankful for each one of you this morning. Whether I see you every day or once in a while. God loves you. Thank you for being good to my friends. Enjoy God. He really is good. Thank him for who he is. And that he never changes. Let's close with prayer. This morning, if you've got something that you want to get right with God on, that you just want to even talk with Him about, that you want to vent to Him about, you do so right there in your chair if you want to. Otherwise, as always, the altar is open. 
But let's just have a word of prayer this morning, and we'll be dismissed. Lord, thank you that you are timeless. Thank you, that you, thank you that you are loving. Thank you that you are truth. Help us just to slow down and learn how to love you by listening. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. Thank you for coming. Better put the furniture back where I found it. Thank you.